Hello, welcome to Neobiotech International Virtual Seminar. Thank you for attending this webinar, and my name is Gabriel Lee. I'm going to be the host for today's webinar. We already had three webinars during this month. These previous webinars are available to watch in Neobiotech YouTube channel. Today's webinar will be the last one for the July. In August, we're gonna have webinars for every Wednesday as well, but in some area, it might be late night on Tuesday. Please visit our website or contact your local sales office for registration. All right, for today's webinar, Dr. Murad from Jordan will speak about predictable rich augmentation and preservation, decision-making and techniques. During about one hour, he will kindly share his experience and knowledge. Please use the chat button to communicate with me about any issues other than topic. We'll have a Q&A session after lecture so please submit your question through Q&A button. Speaker may not answer for all questions because we have limited time to take all questions. If you have more questions or anything for discussion, you can contact Neobiotech website or Facebook page. So from now on, let's have Dr. Murata to start. Please welcome Dr. Murat. Hello, doctor. Are you there? Hello, Gabriel. How are you? Hello, doctor. How's everybody. Hello, doctor. How are All you? Right. I'm good, good. How are you doing? Okay, I'm very fine. Thank you for asking. Okay, let me finish my share screen. All right, perfect. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I'm seeing very well. It's All good. right, are we good to go? Yeah, please. Thank you. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, and uh, good morning if uh, anybody is uh, living in a time zone where it's still in the morning. Um, let me introduce myself uh, quickly. My name is Murad Shackman. I'm from uh, Amman, Jordan. Uh, the time now is 1 p.m. Uh, and um, uh, let me give you uh, uh, just a brief idea about uh, myself. Um, I am uh, a periodontist. Uh, I graduated uh, from the University of Jordan in uh, the year 2000. And then in uh, 2006, I started my uh, periodontology residency at the uh, University of Connecticut in the United States. Uh, uh, and after three years, I got my master's degree in dental sciences and uh, my certificate of uh, periodontology. Um, I practiced for a year and a half uh, in the United States, and then I went back to Amman, Jordan, uh, to become an assistant professor of periodontology at the University of Jordan in Amman. And uh, since then, I've been uh, practicing there, teaching and practicing, and um, uh, my main interests are in um, dental implantology, bridge augmentation, and uh, uh, periodontal soft tissue surgeries. Um, let me uh, uh, just give you a brief introduction of uh, where I come from. Uh, Amman, Jordan, uh, it's uh, in the Middle East, hot zone uh, for you know, uh, a good number of years now. But uh, uh, you might have heard of Petra, uh, which is probably the most uh, famous landmark in Amman, in Jordan. But uh, 
trust me, hopefully when this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation uh, is behind us, I hope you all can um, make the trip to uh, Amman and Jordan and enjoy the many, many beautiful uh, places and many uh, exciting activities to do. Um, I uh, graduated from the University of Connecticut and now practicing at the University of Jordan um, in the University of Jordan Hospital. And uh, luckily, uh, this is something I have a, a lot of passion for. I've uh, been involved in a lot of uh, continuing education for uh, colleagues and dentists in the fields of periodontology and implantology. And uh, that gives me a lot of drive and passion. And I'm here today not to, um, you know, just like Gabriel said, I'm just going to share with you my experience, what uh, we've been doing and what um, I find to work in uh, most of the cases. And hopefully we can have a, a good discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, so without uh, further delay, let's get into the topic. Um, a lot of times on uh, social media, I get these, um, you know, messages about, um, you know, engineering blunders, funny things. Uh, you look at those photos and you, you, you say, gee, what were they thinking when they uh, designed or when they executed uh, this? And um, uh, why do we, you know, why go far? We we actually uh, run into this uh, in our daily practice. Uh, this is an example uh, of, uh, excuse me, just a second. Let me just. Just a second, I apologize. All right. So a lot of times in implant dentistry, unfortunately, you come across cases where, um, you know, this is exactly similar to the uh, pictures you've just seen, just uh, um, an engineering blunder uh, and uh, basically poor planning, poor execution um, of uh, implant dentistry. In an era, we are uh, focusing on a prosthetically driven implant placement. Uh, so these days supposed to be behind us now and you're not supposed to be faced by situations like this. You have, you're supposed to be able to predict and appreciate what kind of outcome uh, you're going to have. So uh, of course all of us uh, that practice uh, surgical placement of dental implants, the surgical aspect of implant dentistry, this is what I hope for. This is what I wish I can find in every patient. Um, uh, you know, single or uh, uh, multiple uh, missing teeth, but with plenty of uh, alveolar ridge where you have no issues uh, placing your implants. Uh, and, you know, it's a straightforward procedure. Patient is happy. You're uh, uh, comfortable, no stress. Unfortunately, the reality is that in a lot of cases, we're faced by situations where you have significant uh, heart tissue as well as soft tissue um, uh, deficiencies in those uh, edentulous areas. And now you have to um, uh, consider, of course, ridge augmentation either at the same time of implant placement or ahead of the uh, implant procedure. And uh, those defects, they come in a wide variety of uh, uh, situations. So you have uh, multiple uh, adjacent missing teeth, you have the single missing tooth, you have sites with uh, vertical defects, with horizontal defects. So it's just a, a, a wide range of uh, uh, situations and scenarios that you might be dealing with. The reality is, if you want to practice uh, prosthetically driven implant placement, more than 50% of implant cases, they will require some sort of bone or soft tissue augmentation. And uh, this is a very important thing. You need to look back at, uh, you know, just kind of do an audit um, of uh, what you've been doing in your office and, and think about how many cases are uh, requiring bone grafting or uh, soft tissue uh, grafting. And uh, more, more than 50% of the cases require some uh, sort of uh, augmentation, which means 
that in this uh, day and time, uh, clinician practicing uh, implant dentistry has to be proficient in ridge augmentation techniques, it has to be capable in uh, diagnosing as well as treatment planning and of course executing those ridge augmentation procedures to be able to deliver uh, the kind of uh, um, results that we are aiming for in today's uh, implant dentistry. There was a time when uh, we opened the flap, uh, we you know, looked for the bone and we placed the implants uh, where the bone is. Uh, of course, we don't do that anymore. Um, you need to kind of um, uh, uh, prosthetically uh, based uh, uh, treatment planning or pr prosthetically driven uh, treatment planning, you decide where the crown of the uh, uh, or the restoration needs to be, and based on that, you decide where the implant needs to be and whether you have enough uh, bone in that side or you have a deficiency that needs to be augmented. So, um, ridge augmentation techniques are um, great, many. Uh, there are so many techniques. Probably the more commonly uh, known techniques, more commonly used techniques are the GBR technique, the guided bone regeneration. Uh, the block grafting is a kind of more traditional classic technique. And uh, we got the crest uh, splitting, but we also have other techniques uh, such as the bone ring. Uh, we have the uh, distraction osteogenesis for more complicated cases. We have the allogenic blocks. We have the thin bone blocks uh, or split bone blocks. So we have a lot of uh, techniques and we have a lot of biomaterials for those techniques. Um, so um, uh, add to that, add to that confusion about what technique should I be using, the different scenarios that we talked about. So you have a single tooth, you have multiple missing teeth, you have uh, uh, horizontal defects, you have vertical defects, you have uh, the mandible, you have the maxilla, you have defects that are within the envelope of the bone, and you have uh, defects that are outside the envelope of the bone. So what we need to do first is to kind of um, uh, assess the defect and determine what kind of defect we are dealing with. So the uh, uh, very simple um, or simplified, let's say, uh, approach is determining in what area of the ridge is your defect. So first, if you see on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the numbers one, two, three, and four. And one and two are on the buccal, three and four on the lingual. So basically, uh, you have, uh, let's say, um, uh, a series or sequential um, uh, severity, uh, let's say, of the bone defect. So you have a bone defect in, in area one, and then uh, a more advanced defect in area one and two, and then and so on, until you get to a situation where you have a very deficient uh, ridge, uh, where you have a complete uh, resorption of the alveolar ridge. So that's the first parameter that we need to um, assess. And I want you guys to um, kind of uh, remember this as we're gonna keep coming back to it. So determine where exactly is the deficiency um, uh, that I have in relation to the position of the implant. And then the second thing we need to evaluate is whether we are dealing with a single tooth or a distal extension or a fully edentulous cases. For the purposes of today's lecture, I'll only talk about the single tooth and the distal extension uh, edentulous uh, spaces. I'm not gonna talk about the fully edentulous because this is a completely different topic. So with today, we're gonna to talk about the single tooth situation and you have the, the different scenarios that you can have where you have uh, deficiency in area number one or number two or three or four. And we're gonna talk about the uh, extended edentulous spaces or the distal extension uh, saddle uh, where you also have either deficiency in the area number one, number two or three or four. So we're gonna keep coming back to this table and this is um, a very nice uh, table from a very nice um, volume from the ITI treatment guide that I uh, suggest uh, all of you to uh, uh, take a look at uh, when you have the time. So um, I'm gonna demonstrate how we assess those cases 
and then how we uh, decide what the treatment plan is. And I'm going to show you how we execute uh, those uh, different treatments uh, uh, using uh, different cases. Okay, so the first case, this is a patient I treated uh, during my residency in the U.S., one of the first cases that I treated, uh, she's a 64-year-old uh, Caucasian female, and her chief complaint, as uh, usual, patients, their interest is in replacing missing teeth, not in placing implants. They actually want teeth to chew on. So that's her uh, chief complaint. Uh, her medical history is non-contributory, and she's a non-smoker. Very important um, aspect. Uh, always need to consider the patient's medical history and the fact whether a patient is a smoker or not. Uh, it means that you are uh, supposed to have a different discussion with the patient, emphasizing the risks uh, and complications uh, that we uh, usually observe at a greater percentage in smokers. Um, uh, she has a history of treated chronic periodontitis or periodontitis, uh, according to the most recent classification. Uh, she suffered from tooth loss, and her plaque control is good. So if you look at her uh, intraoral uh, clinical photos, uh, you can appreciate the uh, dentulous areas on the maxilla as well as in the mandible. Uh, the, the treatment plan initially is to restore uh, to a first molar uh, uh, dentition. Uh, and of course, she's interested in getting uh, fixed uh, uh, restorations so that ideally, we need to place implants in these positions in the uh, number one, four, number one, six, number two, five, and number two, six uh, in the maxilla. And for the sake of the, uh, our lecture today, I'll be talking about uh, how we restored, how we placed the implants on the upper right side of the maxilla. And then we'll come back to uh, the uh, uh, dentulous area on the lower left uh, mandible. So if you look at the panoramic x-ray, uh, that's what we did uh, for you know, a good period of time. We took panoramic x-rays um, with those um, calibration uh, spheres. Uh, but of course, you need to get the 3D x-ray. And like I said, we're going to uh, focus on number 14 and number 16 uh, position. So uh, in the number 14 uh, position, if we place an implant, you can appreciate that the apex of the implant, although at the crest we seem to have uh, adequate uh, bone width, at the crest of the, uh, at the apex of the implant, uh, we would have a fenestration. This is, of course, assuming that we place the implant in the prosthetically proper position. Um, so uh, although crestally I don't have an issue, but there's the, going to be a fenestration in the apical uh, part. Um, so uh, in the number one four position, uh, because of this deficiency that I have mostly in the apical area, what options do I have? Do I go with a guided bone regeneration technique? Do I go with a block graft? Or do I go with a split crest? Now let's go back and look at that um, classification that we talked about. The deficiency I have is more like a small uh, dehiscence defect. So it's more like a, a class one defect. Uh, and this is um, in an extended edentulous space, okay? So I can either do a staged GBR or we can do GBR simultaneously with implant placement. And that's probably what I would have done if uh, this was the only uh, step that needs to be, uh, or the only treatment that needs to be uh, done. Uh, but in the case of this patient, because she also has um, uh, pneumatization of the maxillary sinus, and we are planning to do a lateral window sinus lower elevation, we decided to go with a staged GBR. So we do the guided, the bone grafting in the number one four position, and we do the sinus lift. We let it heal, and then we come back and place uh, the implant. So we went with a staged GBR approach instead of simultaneously placing the implants. Because typically, like I said, if this was the only implant that I need to place, and there, there's going to be a small fenestration of the apex of the implant, uh, um, uh, I would just do it simultaneously. So I would place the implant and do the GBR at the same time. Uh, so that's what we did. We decided to go with a guided bone regeneration. Guided bone regeneration, of course, you can use a resorbable membrane and a non-resorbable membrane. What we did, we used a resorbable membrane. Like I said, this is kind of a more contained defect. The ridge width is more than three or four millimeters. It's only deficient across 
part, a small part of the ridge. So it's a, smally, a small fenestration that we expect. And usually the resolvable membranes, they usually pose the least risk of complications. So that's the plan. We do a sinus lift on number one, six position, and we do um, um, the uh, guided bone regeneration on number four. So uh, based on our assessment, based on the classification and the table I just showed you, now we can have like an idea of what uh, works in this case. But it's very important to remember, it's not enough to have a plan. You have to be able to execute. And I want you to um, look at this gentleman here. Uh, he has a plan, he needs to cross from one side to another, and, but the plan failed. Um, because uh, maybe if had, he had tried that 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, more athletic, more fit, he might have been able to uh, pull this off, just kind of swing and jump to the other side, but it, it failed. So you need to have a plan, but also before you execute, you need to make sure that you're capable of executing that plan. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, show you what we did in this case and maybe spend a bit more time on uh, what I focus on when I do guided bone regeneration, this is probably one of the more common techniques uh, that we do in implant dentistry today, and um, a lot of you have used it. Uh, just some pointers, uh, I think, in my opinion, are important for more predictable uh, results. So first of all, uh, like any procedure, incision design is very, very important. This is the area that needs to be augmented. So when I'm designing my incision, I keep this in mind. This is where my graft needs to be. And I want to make sure that I want to keep my incisions, especially my vertical incision, but also my crustal incision, um, uh, kind of away from the uh, um, augmentation area. I don't want my releasing incisions to be too close to my um, uh, augmentation area. So although a lot of colleagues would uh, place their incisions uh, uh, in this area and avoid extending uh, to the mesial of the canine in this uh, case, my preference always is to go with a releasing incision further away. I know everybody is about kind of minimal surgery, minimal invasive surgery, but I think there are certain um, principles that you need to keep in mind. Uh, you want to keep your incisions um, slightly or further away from your augmentation area. You don't want your membrane, you don't want your bone graft to be very close or sometimes under the releasing incision uh, you're placing. So, um, we place our incision. Uh, you see where the vertical uh, releases. Clean incisions. Uh, no tearing of the flap, clean, full thickness uh, reflection. We elevate, we um, uh, did an osteotomy uh, using um, a piezoelectric uh, device. Uh, back then, that's what I did. I don't do that anymore. I, uh, you know, I do a round uh, window. Uh, honestly, we don't do a this rectangular window anymore. Or we use the, uh, the, the very nice uh, kit that we have from uh, Neobiotic for lateral uh, and the crestal uh, sinus floor elevation where you open the window using just the um, implant handpiece very quickly, very safely. Uh, but that's what we did back then. We elevated the sinus uh, membrane, as you see. What I do a lot of times is uh, we mix um, autogenous and uh, bovine bone. Uh, I prefer to use a mixture of about 50 to 50. Autogenous bone gives you all the um, kind of uh, inductive uh, potential, osteoinduction potential, and a slow resorbing, uh, slow resorbing graft material ensures that you, you have a retention of that graft volume, so you don't use a lot, uh, lose volume. And we go usually to the ramus area to harvest. Now, sometimes uh, you might think, well, I mean, this is a lot of work. Maybe we don't have to use autogenous. Maybe we can just shave a little bit from any nearby, um, you know, prominent, uh, and sometimes you can do that. But if you need uh, a quick and fast way to harvest uh, autogenous bone chips, uh, what I, after a lot of attempts with a lot of devices, in my opinion, this is the safest, fastest, least invasive approach to harvest autogenous bone chips. If you're a guy like me that likes to use autogenous bone chips in his grafts, this is what you need to be using. This is the ACM 
the auto chip maker from uh, Neobiotic, and I, you know, I, I love this thing because it's fast, it's quick, it's clean, um, and it's safe. This is the most important thing. So you got, got this drill and you got the sleeve on it and that uh, keeps the bone chips um, uh, inside uh, within the confines of the uh, drill. And uh, it's uh, very quick, very safe. You see a very small hole and you harvest a lot of autogenous bone chips in very uh, quick time. So we harvest our uh, autogenous uh, bone chips. We mix them with um, the bovine bone. I do a lot of times, in this case, I use the piezo device. A lot of times I use the, uh, just the handpiece, uh, just a round burr to create like uh, perforations in the cortex just to kind of invite uh, more bleeding from the cancellous bone uh, into the uh, graft uh, area and also invite uh, hopefully mesenchymal cells with a lot of uh, regeneration uh, potential. So we placed our uh, graft, covered it in this case with two layers of membrane. Very important, a lot of times I make sure to uh, secure my membranes, uh, even if they're uh, uh, you know, resolvable membranes, I still try to secure them um, uh, to make sure that um, you know, I have a lot of uh, uh, peace of mind when I'm suturing. The membrane is not moving, I have more containment of my graft and more maintenance of that space that I'm trying to uh, augment. So we use those uh, tacks, uh, closure, we use nylon um, sutures or um, uh, APTFE sutures. And this is the x-ray. And this is one week uh, later, very nice healing. Patient does have a thick biotype, so that helps, of course. Uh, typically, uh, what I do is I uh, wait uh, three months, three to four months for this kind of uh, guided bone regeneration. And we went back and you can see a very nice uh, integration of my uh, graft. Uh, also, the sinus area is uh, very uh, nicely integrated and we place our implants uh, without any issues with adequate um, bulk of bone. So um, uh, the second uh, scenario is for the same patient. That's why it says case number one. So it's the same patient, but now let's look at tooth number 36. Tooth number 36, uh, you can see uh, we have the 3D uh, x-ray. Uh, and uh, you can appreciate in the number three, six position, how significantly deficient this ridge is. So you have a deficiency across the entire length of the ridge and uh, implant placement is absolutely not um, feasible uh, in this situation, of course. So um, if you look at the options that we have, should we do a guided bone regeneration in this case? Should we do a block graft? Or can we do a split crest? If we look back at that classification that we started with, and uh, you can appreciate that we're looking at uh, uh, defect uh, of the second type, where you have deficiency in areas number one and two. So uh, it's more like um, a kind of a knife edge. And uh, it's not a bounded edentulous area. So you have an extended uh, edentulous space. You have missing teeth all the way on the distal. So if you look at the options that you have, and we're looking at an, uh, uh, deficiency in area number one and two, and you have less than four millimeters, and in this case, we have about, about two, the ideal scenario would be to do a stage bone block. Um, if you want, you can do guided bone regeneration, uh, but I think uh, your ability to have a predi predictable result, and people who have done uh, GBR in those cases can appreciate that uh, this is a challenging situation. So our preference was for a staged uh, bone block. I know, Block grafts does not have a lot of um, uh, popularity. It's not really a fan favorite. Uh, but I think there are situations where, uh, you know, bone block is the um, kind of the more uh, uh, reasonable way uh, to proceed. 
So we went with a blog graft, and uh, like I said, uh, patient is a non-smoker, and for me, that's a very important thing. I'm usually very, um, you know, concerned or wary uh, when the patient is a smoker, and we have to do a blog graft. So um, I usually anticipate more complications. The ridge is narrow, less than four millimeters. Uh, in those cases, I prefer to do a blog graft, and it's deficient across the entire length of the ridge. So it's deficient across the entire length of the ridge and you have an extended edentulous space. So it's not only one tooth gap where you have the peaks of the prominences of the adjacent teeth that can help support a membrane if we were to do a guided bone regeneration. In this case, it's different. You have an extended edentulous space and that's why we went with a block graft in this case. So clinically, what we did reflection, uh, we went to the symphysis area we harvested the graft using the piezo device, secured the blog graft. I'm not gonna go into details, of course, do the technique and you know a lot of uh, clinical um, uh, pointers and, and tips that you have to make sure of. Um, and um, we placed a little bit of um, uh, autogenous uh, bone as well, filling those uh, gaps. Um, and this is the donor site, double layer closure. And then we closed uh, the site, uh, the recipient site, uh, with uh, both uh, Gore-Tex uh, sutures as well as nylon sutures. And um, this is the closure of the donor site um, using uh, chromic gut. This is one week healing. Um, you know, it's uh, no uh, issues. It's healing with the normal limits. And uh, six months later, we go back, we see very nice integration of the uh, block graft and we were able to place a uh, regular uh, diameter implant, a four millimeter implant in that uh, site. And this is the, the x-ray. So again, this is another scenario where you have a deficiency um, and uh, you uh, use uh, your assessment, you use your findings to come up with a treatment plan. Moving on to a second case, uh, or let's say a third scenario. So in this time, the patient is also a 30 year old Caucasian female. Uh, she has a missing tooth, uh, non-contributory medical history. She's healthy and she uh, smokes uh, shisha uh, uh, occasionally, which is very popular in our region. Um, and uh, her, her plaque control is uh, good. Uh, she um, has suffered from you know, um, several missing teeth um, uh, on the maxilla and the mandible as well. But uh, this is the site that we are looking into. This is tooth number 24 or 24, the first premolar. So uh, patient lost that tooth. There was an attempt to place an implant uh, that failed uh, due to an infection and resulted in significant uh, resorption in that site. So this is the uh, clinical picture. And um, we go to our uh, 3D uh, reconstruction. And you can appreciate there's a significant ridge uh, deficiency. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a single tooth gap. And you can appreciate that we have adjacent teeth and we have uh, the peaks and the prominences of the bone on the adjacent teeth. So uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of a, let's say, a contained defect. Not entirely contained, but it's um, more or less because of the um, existing uh, adjacent teeth, uh, they do offer um, some uh, uh, kind of support for my uh, biomaterials and my membrane uh, if I do uh, an augmentation procedure. So, um, and if you place your uh, implant, you can appreciate that it's deficient uh, across a good length of uh, my uh, implant. So, what do I have in this case? Uh, do I do a GBR? Do I do a block graft? Or do I do a split crest? Let's go back to how we uh, classified this uh, defect. Again, the patient is for the most part missing uh, bone in area number one, but also a little bit in area number two. So it's kind of in the middle between being just a one four or a two four. And if you look at this matrix, uh, if you have a one four situation, you can go with a GBR with simultaneous implant placement 
or if you have a 2-4, you, you can go with a state GBR, but also an alternative technique is GBR simultaneously with the implant placement. So um, uh, whether you consider it a 1-4 or a 2-4 position, uh, GBR with simultaneous implant placement is an option, is the go-to option in my opinion. I'd rather not do a block graft. I have these prominences of bone on the adjacent teeth, so we went with GBR with simultaneous implant placement. Uh, and in this case, what I prefer to use is instead of using a resolvable membrane, just because I want to bulk up that ridge, I want uh, a space uh, preserving device. So I want a non-resolvable membrane that can maintain the space in this area. And that's what we used. We need uh, a space forming membrane. We uh, use it in larger defects. And that's what we decided to do. So clinically, uh, this is after uh, flap reflection. And you can see I extend my incisions uh, a little bit, again, just to make sure that I'm not too close to the um, uh, augmentation area. In this case, we decided to go with uh, the um, uh, CTI membranes. These are membranes um, uh, that I usually get from the Neobiotech. Uh, titanium membranes, uh, they're very smart, very easy to use in my opinion because they're easy to stabilize because they have this hole uh, um, and they come in different sizes, different shapes and you can use the cover screw to actually anchor and stabilize that membrane. So you form the membrane and you stabilize it using the cover screw and you can see the different shapes and different um, uh, uh, sizes they come in depending on what kind of augmentation whether you want augmentation only on the buckle or you need some augmentation also to take place on the uh, uh, lingual uh, so uh, we place the uh, bone graft uh, again a mixture of uh, autogenous and um, bovine bone uh, slow resorbing graft material uh, we extracted the number two six and uh, closure and uh, this is my uh, IS2 implant, um, a neobiotic implant, uh, very good primary stability. That's one of the things that I love. Uh, although you've seen the big defect that we have and only the apical part is really engaging the bone, but you can achieve very nice uh, primary stability. And this is the ridge uh, after four months of healing and you can appreciate the before and after. We have very nice uh, buildup of that uh, ridge and that thanks of course to that titanium membrane. And uh, of course you have to go back and remove it. Retrieving it is not hard at all. Uh, I only place, I do a small crustal incision, remove the cover screw and take out the membrane very gently, tease it off from under that uh, flap and you can see the nice um, lip of bone that we have there on the buckle. And uh, this is a provisional that was um, prepared by the uh, restorative dentist, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ayman. And um, this is just a week after, and uh, I don't have the uh, final photos, uh, which I'm sure I'm, I should get, but uh, you can see very nice uh, uh, soft tissue um, healing around that uh, provisional. We need to work a bit on the flat control um, but very successful uh, augmentation in that site. So uh, uh, in that last scenario, we saw how we also use GBR, but we made a kind of a, a different decision as far as what kind of membrane uh, we can use. And we opted for um, a non resorbable membrane because of the uh, size of the defect uh, that we have. So the third uh, case I want to share with you is uh, for a colleague, a dentist colleague that I treat in uh, Doha in Qatar. Uh, she works with me at the same uh, center. She's a 56 year old uh, Asian uh, female and uh, she has multiple missing teeth. Also, she's healthy, she's a non-smoker and her plaque control is good. Uh, if you look at the panoramic x-ray, you can appreciate how we have Multiple missing teeth. She's been wearing partial dentures for a very long period of time. She does have significant um, occlusive wear. And although, of course, the recommendation was that she goes through uh, full mouth rehabilitation with correction of that um, severe wear. Uh, but honestly, you know, she, she only wanted to restore, um, you know, minimalistically, not to go through extensive treatment. 
So our plan was to place implants uh, to restore those uh, missing teeth. Um, uh, and my focus for the uh, for the you know purpose of today's uh, topic is uh, uh, on the upper right uh, area. So the plan is to place uh, two implants in the uh, number uh, one uh, four position and the number uh, one six position, uh, three and five according to the ADA uh, numbering system. Uh, so, and uh, you can see we have a deficient um, or a pneumatized sinus, so we need to do a sinus floor um, elevation. And in the number five position, which is what I'm going to focus on, you can appreciate how I have a, um, a narrow ridge. Uh, we have a slightly uh, deficient area. Um, and uh, we need to do some augmentation there because I don't have the minimum 1.5 millimeter of bone that I need on both uh, buccal and palatal. So if I put my implant in the prosthetically proper position, and in this case, you can appreciate we also used, we were planning on using angled uh, abutments. Still, I'm, uh, very, I have very thin bone on the buckle. So what would you do? Would you do a GBR? Would you do a block graft? Probably not. Or would you do a split crest? So let's assess this defect. So we have a deficiency uh, pretty much in area number one and two. Uh, so uh, not only are we deficient in uh, uh, number uh, one area, but also it's a two four situation. So in a two four situation, if you go back to this table and it's an extended edential space because we don't have adjacent teeth on both sides, we have more than four millimeters. So in this case, my preference is to go for a ridge split. And uh, I would do a ridge split mostly in the maxilla. Ridge split in the mandible is a bit uh, more difficult and slightly carries greater risk of complications when you do a ridge split in the mandible. First, the cortical bone is more difficult to uh, mobilize and there's always a, a risk of fracture of that uh, buccal segment that you're trying to split. So my preference if you're going to go for rich splitting is to usually try and do it in the maxilla. And I know that a lot of companies uh, that, uh, you know, uh, recommend uh, using a piezoelectric device um, where really the cuts are very thin and you um, sacrifice only very small uh, thickness of bone, uh, maybe half a millimeter of bone. And they recommend, uh, they even, uh, you know, um, they profess that you can do it even when you have, you know, three millimeters of bone or even less than that. My preference is always look for at least four millimeters. Uh, if you have less than four millimeters, it becomes a bit tight because you, you need to maintain 1.5 millimeters on each side of the ridge. Uh, not only that, keep in mind when you do a split press, your implant usually moves a bit buckle. Your palatal segment is um, uh, rigid or it's, um, it's, it's put, it's not moving. The buckle segment is moving. So when you're placing your implant, automatically what's gonna happen is the implant is gonna tilt a bit buckly because your buckle segment is more movable. So my preference is you need at least four millimeters of bone and it's better to be done in the maxilla. And in this case, that's what we did. I think we had a perfect scenario for the situation. Of course, if you're going to do a split crest, nowadays I think it only makes sense to use it with, with a piezoelectric device. It doesn't make sense to use it with a, you know, kind of a more traditional way. Um, so you either need a piezoelectric device or a, a saw. Uh, prefer to use it in the maxilla ridge with at least four millimeters. And like you saw in this area, it's like a two-four situation where it's deficient across almost the entire buccal segment. Uh, you have to keep in mind it's a technique sensitive procedure and there's a learning curve. Uh, so start with cases that are kind of more uh, forgiving, uh, simpler cases, like I said, and then you can uh, challenge yourself more with this uh, technique. So initially what we did, we did uh, the sinus uh, floor augmentation. Uh, we let it heal um, and then we came back to place the implant simultaneously in both the uh, first premolar position and the first uh, molar position. Um, uh, let me just uh, uh, take a short break. Gabriel, uh, uh, 
I'm assuming you would let me know everything is okay, correct? The audio, the slides. Yes, everything is okay. Your voice, your voice right, sounds very good. I know, I know it's a bit late <laughs> during the presentation, but um, I just wanted to double check. Okay, so right, okay. Um, we did the sinus floor uh, augmentation. We let it heal. We went back because usually when you're doing a rich split, you have to place the implant at the same time. So one might ask, why didn't you do the rich splitting and the sinus augmentation at the same time? If I'm doing the rich splitting, I have to place the implant at the same time. And uh, because I cannot place the implant simultaneously in the number six position, the first molar position, because I only have about two millimeter of residual bone height, I decided to stage it. So we do the sinus floor uh, augmentation first, wait uh, for six months and then come back and do the implant placement together with the uh, split crest in the uh, number uh, first molar position. So uh, you can see the panoramic x-ray. We placed the implants in the mandible already and uh, we have that sinus augmentation. And uh, um, in the number of uh, um, first premolar position, uh, crescent incision and we only reflect minimally on the buckle and palatal. You don't reflect on the buckle. I don't place releasing incisions because I want to maintain the periosteum attached on that buckle segment. That kind of works as of course, maintains better blood supply to that buccal segment, but also it, it kind of secures the buccal segment better so that it does not completely get separated in case it gets fractured. So using that uh, piezoelectric device, uh, you place your crestal cut in the bone and you place vertical cuts. It's not enough to place a crestal cut. You need to place vertical cuts in the bone and then gradually expand. You prepare the site. You still have to use the uh, drills uh, from the manufacturer and we place the implant uh, in both sides in the first molar position and the uh, first premolar position. We grafted uh, the gap with the bovine bone. It did not mix it with autogenous, just use the bovine bone, covered it with a membrane and uh, closed. And you can see this is the panoramic x-ray after the implant placement. And this is uh, after uncovery. You can see very nice uh, ridge width, uh, very nice integration of the bone graft the implant, very stable. And uh, you can see how the implant is slightly tilted towards the buckle. It's not, it's not terrible, but it's slightly tilted towards the buckle. Um, and that's to be expected when you're doing uh, rich uh, splitting. And this is the uh, permanent restoration. I don't know why the restoration on the mandible looks like that, but um, I think it has to do with the minimal restorative space. Um, and the last and final scenario, uh, last and final case I want to share with you is a kind of a more uh, complex uh, situation. Uh, so this is a, a Jordanian patient. She's a 37 year old female. Um, uh, she has a non-significant medical history and she's healthy and she's a non-smoker. When I first saw her, she was referred to me uh, with this situation. She already had an implant placed and you can appreciate the mucogingival, um, you know, soft tissue defect that she has. And um, she was referred to me uh, because the restoring dentist now is stuck with this patient. The patient was sent to her uh, from the surgeon. And uh, obviously you can appreciate how the position of the implant is not ideal. Um, it's not optimal to say the least. And she was sent to me to, uh, to see if maybe we can do a soft tissue graft on that implant. And um, uh, this is the photo, uh, the occlusal photo of that implant. You can see how uh, severely buckly positioned that implant is. So it's not in a proper three-dimensional position, it's not in a proper prosthetically driven uh, uh, position. Uh, when you remove the um, uh, healing abutment, you can appreciate the uh, periimplant mucosal margin. There's absolutely no keratinized tissue there. She did have uh, two rounds of um, augmentation done there, uh, mostly uh, guided bone regeneration. Um, and uh, because of the repeated advancement of the flap, you can see now she has no keratinized tissue at all at the buckle. Luckily, uh, when I checked on the implant, the implant was loose. This is an eight millimeter implant and actually it uh, came out. So 
um, you know, too bad for the patient, but uh, honestly, you know, I was pleased that the implant uh, was not, um, that, that the implant came out because it's not in a, a, a proper position. Uh, so, uh, anticipating the need for uh, augmentation in this area, and because she's missing, uh, she's lacking keratinized tissue in the area, I did decided to go with uh, free gingival graft to augment the uh, tissues in that uh, side. At the same time, uh, we removed the implant, and we did the free gingival graft uh, in the area, and uh, it healed uh, without any uh, complications. And then the patient disappeared. Sorry. Then the patient disappeared uh, for two years. And when she comes back, you can see how that free gingival graft now is so, um, you know, very highly keratinized, like a patch uh, situation. But at least we don't have any deficiency of keratinized tissue. We can plasty that a bit and make it look uh, better. So now, two years later, the patient is still wearing uh, her partial denture, and she comes back, and now she wants to get, uh, uh, now she's fed up enough with the partial denture, and now she wants to get uh, an implant to replace that missing tooth. So we take a 3D x-ray, and uh, lo and behold, of course, not surprisingly, you can appreciate that she has a significant ridge defect. She has not only a horizontal ridge defect, but she also has a vertical ridge defect. And you can appreciate it here in, in that uh, red uh, line that I drew on that uh, x-ray. Uh, so uh, if you want to classify that defect that she has, um, actually uh, it falls in the um, uh, number two, four, kind of three, four uh, situation because we have a vertical component as well as a horizontal component. So this is more like a three, four situation. So if you look at your matrix and uh, you look at your um, combined horizontal and vertical defect, the uh, optimal approach is a stage GBR with a space preserving device. So it's better to use a non resorbable membrane. Uh, where you can maintain uh, that space uh, for augmentation. An alternative technique would be to do a bone block and a shell technique. Uh, usually I go with those uh, techniques if I have an extended uh, edentulous uh, space. If I have a bounded uh, single tooth gap with adjacent teeth, I usually prefer to go with guided bone regeneration. And that's what we did in this case. We went with a stage GBR approach. Um, we reflected, and you can see here on the occlusal photo, you can see the remnants of the bone grafting that was done. So I have a bulk of uh, kind of grafting on the buckle. My main deficiency, the horizontal deficiency, actually is on the palatin. If I'm going to place my implant in the prosthetically um, uh, optimal position, so I have a defect that is uh, vertical, as you can appreciate, but also has a um, horizontal palatal component. And that's why when we um, uh, planned it, we placed a tenting screw uh, to support my membrane. And we also used a, a titanium membrane, um, CTI membrane uh, from uh, Neobiotech. And we actually secured it on the palatin. Uh, that's where my main deficiency is. Uh, and the, the, uh, the uh, membrane uh, was secured uh, using that tenting screw. And you can appreciate, uh, we also tacked uh, the membrane and the, uh, we covered the buccal aspect. Uh, this is again a mixture of autogenous and um, uh, bovine bone. Uh, and you can see this very uh, you know, generous amount of autogenous bone that we also harvested with the ACM. Uh, and we covered the, uh, the buccal aspect with the membrane, with a, uh, with a resorbable collagen membrane. Uh, so we have a, quite a significant augmentation. We left it for six months. You can appreciate the vertical improvement, uh, let's say, of the uh, site. And uh, we went back six months later to place the implant. We retrieved the membrane. Uh, you can appreciate the augmentation that we achieved. Um, and we went ahead and we placed our implant in the prosthetically optimal position. You can appreciate uh, the position. Um, and this is the uh, periapical of the patient. 
and uh, uh, two months later, we uncovered uh, the implant, not six months, two months later, we uncovered the uh, implant, placed the healing abutment, did a crown lengthening, aesthetic crown lengthening on the adjacent teeth. And um, the patient had to get a 3D x-ray because she was having a resorptive uh, issue on the lateral incisor. So we were able to visualize the position of the implant and the um, uh, augmented bone. And uh, we were pleased to see that we have plenty of bone uh, all around that implant, but also on the palatal, like I said, because that's where the deficiency was. And uh, this is uh, the provisional that the patient received. Uh, uh, she received um, you know, some plasty to kind of uh, uh, make the gingival margin uh, symmetrical. This is the day of the insertion of the um, provisional. Uh, so uh, this is before when I first saw her, and this is after uh, patient uh, still uh, undergoing treatment, but a significant improvement, and now she has an implant that was uh, placed in the prosthetically optimal uh, position. And this is before uh, and after. At least she can lose the um, partial uh, denture. Um, so it's important to consider when you're looking at those patients and you're looking at those cases where you have a deficiency, uh, it's very important to start evaluating the patient's medical history. Patients who are diabetic, patients who have uh, chronic diseases, patients who have, uh, take medication, bisphosphonates, those patients are at greater risks for complications. Patients who are smokers have greater risk for complications, whether you're doing a GPR or a blood graft or whatever. Uh, so that's a very important discussion you need to have with your patient, and you have to weigh the uh, risk-benefit uh, ratio. Sometimes you might switch from uh, an ideal uh, situation for a bone block because you want to reduce the risk and maybe switch to an alternative technique where you can use GBR, which I believe uh, offers or comes with slightly risk, uh, less risk of complications. So that's something you have to consider uh, when you're making a decision. Uh, you have to consider the residual ridge, uh, ridge width uh, that's a very important parameter you need to evaluate uh, whether you want to do a guided bone regeneration technique or an alternative technique. It's very important to consider the shape of the defect and the location of the defect. So whether it's a contained defect, it's bounded by adjacent teeth, or you're dealing with an extended edential space uh, like some of the cases that I showed you. Um, uh, Pre-operative planning is uh, very, very important, uh, and uh, you need to be able to execute the technique. You have to have a good surgical approach, uh, use the proper uh, good choice in selecting the biomaterials, depending also on the augmentation that you want to uh, achieve. Uh, and very, very important, you need um, uh, to be comfortable with your skills but also you need very good surgical tools. And I've showed you how, uh, you know, from the membranes to harvesting the autogenous bone, to using the tacks, uh, using the fixation screws, um, you have to be, um, a, you know, um, able to select from a wide range of uh, tools to, to deliver your uh, optimal outcome. And for me, I just want to share with you uh, how, you know, having and using the, the proper tool is very important. Almost done, almost successful. But then it ends in disaster if you don't have the proper tools you don't use the proper tools and you're uh, based on your experience and uh, level of skill. Uh, once again, this is a night shot of the beautiful city of Amman, the capital of Jordan. Uh, this is the Roman amphitheater. This is downtown Amman, beautiful place. I, uh, I invite everybody, hopefully with uh, once this corona situation is resolved and improved, all of you can visit and we can share uh, our knowledge and experience and you know stories um, um, in person. Um, although this uh, online experience is, is, is uh, 
great because uh, we can connect uh, although we are thousands of miles away um, thank you for attending uh, I wish um, you know that was uh, enjoyable and uh, there was something to benefit from and uh, if you have any questions um, I'll be more than happy in the time available to answer them Gabriel yes uh, uh... Any of question will be welcomed. Please uh, use the Q&A session or chat uh, communication chat button, please. Uh, if you, any of you have a question. Uh, so far, we don't have any question in Q&A box. So uh, I don't think uh, we, we have question waiting. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you might, you can finish your lecture file. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So, um, uh, unless we have any questions, uh, once again, uh, let me uh, let me check. Oh yeah, one question maybe uh, might be uh, from yeah all right, one. Let me let me stop the sharing. Okay. All right. All right. Let me see. All right. We have uh, one question from an anonymous attendee. So, but I yes. don't see the question yet. So. <laughs> Neither me. Maybe he's uh, writing at this moment. So uh, let's wait. Oh, yeah. The, there is a, here we go. All right, so the question is, uh, for the split bridge case, what do you think of this option? Sinus and GBR, same time, then implants uh, later on. I think it is an option, of course. Um, but in this case, remember, um, the case I showed you for the first premolar position does not have an adjacent tooth. Um, so, uh, for me, it's considered an extended edentulous space. In an extended edentulous space, when you have a deficiency in area number one and two, you are trying to augment outside the envelope of the bone. When you're augmenting outside the envelope of the bone, um, uh, GBR, in my opinion, you have to use a space-forming device. So, it's better to use a non over membrane make sure that you have very good uh, stabilization of that membrane using tacking or screws or uh, what have you. Uh, with the, the advantage of a split crest is that you converted uh, a defect that is outside the bony envelope, you converted it into uh, a defect within the envelope of bone because you moved, you moved that buccal segment and now your defect is pretty much in the middle between the buccal and palatal segment. So that's, that's kind of the advantage of this case. Like I said, um, you have to have certain uh, conditions um, in those situations where split crests would work beautifully, where you have at least um, uh, four millimeter of, uh, of bone uh, so that uh, you don't risk, first of all, fracture of that buccal segment. Uh, and also you have, um, you know, very good uh, stability of that uh, uh, buccal segment. So you can do a GBR. I would go with a, the non lysosomal membrane, to be honest, in this case. But of course, it is an option. If you look at that matrix, it's actually one of the options as, as an alternative. As an alternative. Um, how much bone and vertical augmentation can we grow? Um, usually, with a with a GBR situation, and we have a lot of uh, techniques uh, for well not a lot of techniques but I mean uh, you can use uh, tenting screws you can use resolvable membranes non resolvable membranes um, but usually I would say a safe um, estimate is probably two to four millimeters I know in some um, uh, literature there that says you can grow up to six millimeter of bone and that's probably true um, in, in the hands of you know, very uh, experienced clinicians who do these uh,
type of augmentations day in and day out. I, I, uh, what I can tell you for sure that vertical augmentation is a, a very challenging thing and uh, uh, operator experience is very, very important. So definitely uh, uh, leave those augmentations, um, uh, kind of uh, let them wait a bit until you're comfortable with your surgical skills and approach and technique and management of the flaps and handling of the uh, um, defects uh, because they're definitely more challenging and they require um, more experience. Um, how to choose the correct tenting screw height. Uh, I think it's just uh, you need to determine how much augmentation uh, you want to do. Um, uh, I think a fatal mistake is to uh, uh, place your tenting screw too high, which means that you're aiming for a very significant augmentation. Usually if, if you're, and if you notice in that last case that I showed you where we did some vertical augmentation, the tenting screw was at the level of the peaks of the bone on the adjacent teeth. I would not put it any higher than that. So that's my, my maximum uh, level that I'm hoping for. Uh, so uh, the maximum usually is, usually you go with the peaks of bone on the uh, adjacent tooth, or maybe if you're looking at a, in the mandible, uh, you have uh, you know the curvature of the arch of the mandible, and that's the peak of bone that you that you use to guide you in the position of the tenting screw. Uh, sorry, same case, but how about condensation burrs instead of uh, split ridge? Yes, so we have a lot of options uh, now in terms of uh, products that you can use where you condense the bone and instead of doing this traditional, you know, traditional split crest, you can use these um, uh, burrs that kind of um, push and um, uh, increase the density of the bone in that area. Uh, that is an option. Uh, honestly, I don't have a lot of experience with it, um, but that, that, that might be an interesting uh, approach. Um, what I tried to present today is nothing uh, very, you know, um, kind of more classic approach, that are more predictable, something that has been tried and tested again and again. And we know we have a lot of evidence that supports uh, GBR and supports corticocancillus block grafting uh, and that have very predictable uh, results. I know that block grafting is not very um, popular. Uh, um, and it comes with greater risk, uh, or it needs uh, more experience uh, um, uh, with these uh, procedures. But I think there, is a, there are scenarios where uh, log grafting is the ideal way to go. A GPR, if you ask me how many cases of GPR do you do versus log grafting, yes, the vast majority of augmentations we use GPR because the defects, they allow us to do GPR. So it really comes down to what kind of defect you are dealing with. All right, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, if you have more questions, please uh, use our website or, or contact uh, by email address, please. Thank you for the question. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for the lecture, Dr. Murat. It was very uh, awesome. So it was very good. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And we would like to have uh, your opinion for today's webinar. There will be an extra pattern between these five questions. So please share one minute for us. We're going to always try the best to improve the quality of webinar for your satisfaction. Please, please stay connected with New Biotech social media to communicate with us more. Search New Biotech in Facebook and YouTube, then do like and subscribe to get more information.
the lecture will be uploaded in our website with YouTube video, so you can watch again this lecture later at any time. For the next upcoming webinar, it will be a 5th August next Wednesday. Dr. Christopher from Australia will give the lecture. The title will be Aesthetics in Implant Dentistry Strategic Factors for Success in English. Please remind that we do not have a translation service. If you have any questions or information needed, please contact us by email address. And don't forget, you can get more information in our website and social network service. Thank you for attending our webinar today. We hope all of you enjoyed this time. Please have a good day or good night. See all of you again sooner. Thank you and bye.